component of the guerrilla movement. Um, uh, so I had some things to say about how he developed that narrative. I must say that I read this manuscript that was sent to UCLA for uh, Nikki Kelly, uh, my teacher, to look at, and Kelly was whatever, they didn't, couldn't deal with it, um, and gave it to me to read. I was a graduate student. I read it, and of course I was again blown away, and the book had not come out, and uh, uh, there was one question I had for him that remained to be answered, because I said, well, look, you told the story of this organization that you call revolutionary and socialist, and they, um, they admitted borrowing from Marxism, and they kind of read that back into Xi sources, and after the revolution, they were there, they were shut out of power, Khomeini never acknowledged them, although he had borrowed a lot of things from them, he was clever enough not to uh, denounced them like the rest of the clergy. He remained silent, uh, and uh, then afterwards uh, they launched their uprising against the regime. And like everybody else, the rest of us were pummeled and crushed and destroyed. And then he traces that story into how they turn into this religious political cult in exile that become a tool of Saddam Hussein's uh, invasion of Iran, and. Uh, the big question is, how can that amazing transformation take place in about 20 years? How can you go from a, uh, this breakthrough, uh, auspicious beginning to this tragic, uh, farcical ending? And uh, I think I remember the response he gave me was, uh, I have an answer for you, but there wasn't uh, sufficient time to explain in the book. I'll tell you sometime later. So, this maybe maybe can tell us now we have a chance to, uh, to discuss that. Uh, so, uh, how much more time do I have, Mr. Chairman? Mm -hmm. Two minutes. Max. Two minutes. Okay. Two minutes max. Uh, okay, so let me just, uh, I wanted to give more content analysis of that book, but let me just uh, say something about why this book was also a breakthrough like Iran between two revolutions. And I would say, uh, what the analytical uh, understandings of the revolution and the Islamic Republic, the understanding of the Islamic Republic is more in Iranian Mujahideen and of course less in the first one. I think that remained basically unchanged uh, in, in even Khomeini's and, and uh, that what he had to say, the big breakthrough things he had to say, he had said I think in those two early books. Uh, but you, if you understand them in the context of the 1980s, as Kaver mentioned, everybody, people who became, uh, you know, experts, Said Amir Arjuman, others were obsessed with Shiism and ideology. But Abu Hamid was showing the class and social underpinnings of. He did not uh, devalue ideology, but he grounded it in social theory and things like class conflict. That was very important. And uh, that remains uh, standing until today. And this was different from also um, even works that appeared in the 1990s, uh, Dabashi, for example, uh, who uh, assimilates all strands of what he calls Islamic ideology into one uh, overarching, uh, uh, one single uh, coherent reading of Shiism. But, uh, uh, all of them are building Islamic ideology. But if you read Abraham Yano, that's not the case. The revolutionary interpretation of Shiism was something else. And so that, that was the difference. So in the interest of time, before Turaj calls me to, to halt, uh, uh, I am going to stop and we can talk more about these in uh, Q&A conversation. But I just one more thing. I'm going to abuse my position because I see so many uh, people here that I think should should speak, uh, such as Ay Surusha Aziz uh, Senior, I, I guess and Junior also here. And maybe maybe uh, they should definitely take part in this conversation. Um, I first encountered the work of uh, Rhonda Brahamian 
exactly 31 years ago uh, as an undergraduate student at Boston University where uh, my uh, professor Irene Genzier uh, assigned his book, Iran Between Two Revolutions, um, for a course that we were having on politics of the Middle East. Um, it is no exa exaggeration to say that I was uh, mesmerized by um, uh, that, that book. A book that I continue to consult today and um, checking my library if there is one book where the pages are coming off uh, because it has been you know, read again and again and again. Uh, it's no other than Iran's, um, uh, Iran between two revolutions. The book, of course, appealed to us on a number of uh, grounds. Um, a, um, we were impressed by the analytical rigor that uh, the book exhibited. Um, but also more, you know, sort of secondary or mundane things. Uh, I, again, uh, recall vividly where uh, in the book uh, Iran has tables, um, data, on members of the, um, you know, uh, the group of 53, or on the father Yona Khal, etc., and uh, those tables um, have left uh, the indelible mark on me because I realized, you know, again, as a as a young undergraduate student back then, the, the real importance of doing, you know, empirical work and being able to um, uh, look at, at trends that develop and taking, you know, those biographical information rather uh, mm -hmm. uh, seriously. Um, but in addition to just the academic appeal of the book, uh, at that time, we were a bunch of uh, leftist students uh, in search of a book that could really help us make sense mm -hmm. of the revolution that had transpired a few years ago. And that search really came to an end, uh, at least for me, when I encountered um, uh, Iran's Iran between uh, two revolutions, um, uh, because it, you know, it, it, it proved to be quite different from uh, the other stuff that you know, we were reading. What set his work uh, apart from others for me was that the focus wasn't on the traditional style of intellectual history. Right? Everyone is not concentrating on, on, on one individual and not seeing the larger you know, uh, ambiance in which that person um, is, is working. Uh, it, this is social history. Uh, individuals, thinkers, etc., are located uh, in, a, in a larger context of what is happening in, in, in the society at that time. Um, I don't have time, um, of course, to um, you know, provide uh, ample examples of um, uh, individuals uh, that he does this for, whether we are talking about the Qajar era or the Pahlavi era. Uh, but again, let me just say uh, that whether it's a discussion of Talibov, uh, Malcolm Khan, Kermani, um, this is a type of intellectual history or social history that is uh, worth apart from that undertaken by the likes of Feridun Adamiyat, uh, 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 for example. Or when he discusses the Pahlavi era, and we encounter names like Tabia Rani, Kasravi, uh, Khalil Maliki, Al Ahmad, Shariati, and, and many, many uh, others. Again, um, uh, Abrahamian uh, does a uh, uh, masterful job of placing these individuals in that larger uh, in a context that, 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 that is called for. Uh, my colleagues were mentioning their favorite essays. Um, uh, perhaps my favorite essay was the one that Afshin just referred to, the one on Kasravi, on the national integrationists of Iran. Uh, you know, if there is one essay that I want to recommend to the younger students about how to write um, you know, a, a biography of a major thinker uh, in Iran, uh, uh, no doubt it will be um, uh, Iran's essay on, uh, on Kasravi. Because, uh, again, you get to see uh, how Kasravi is in, in dialogue with what is happening you know, during that time period, you know, from the uh, Constitutional Revolution to the Reza Shah uh, period, and again, what's happening next door uh, in, in Turkey, and this need right, for creating a, a, a national integration uh, for the country. Um, and it's not just individuals, of course that are uh, uh, in the, you find in the works of uh, uh, Abrahamian. 
Um, again, uh, if you are interested in the uh, group of 53, if you're interested in the two the party, if you're interested in, you know, uh, uh, in Mujahideen al Khal, again, you find yourself in, the, in a position where you have to go back, refer constantly to Arwan's uh, work. I mean, his, his book on uh, Mujahideen was so critical that the organization felt the need to, to write a major book in response to the type of criticism that um, uh, Abrahamian had, had uh, voiced regarding uh, uh, Mujahideen uh, Khal. Um, um, Erwan's work was um, influential for um, uh, me in other ways later on in the 1980s and 1990s where um, with a group of friends such as uh, Dr. Ali Mirsapasi and the late Mehrdad um, al and others, we were um, publishing a journal named Kankash. Uh, again, we tried to remain uh, faithful as much as we could to that analytical approach that Abrahamian had so nicely uh, championed in, in his work and of course you know, published some of his own essays in that uh, uh, journal as well. So um, let me uh, say that um, I, I come across uh, Iran's work in so many ways, sometimes in unexpected places. A few weeks ago, I was reading a, a doctoral dissertation uh, that I'm not going to name, uh, and um, you know, uh, I encountered two pages in this doctoral dissertation that was plagiarized word by word from uh, Iran between two <laughs> revolutions. And I realized I had read this someplace before and consulted the Iran between the revolutions, and sure enough, for, for this poor guy, you know, he managed to plagiarize on a very important book, and, uh, you know, it became history. Uh, anyhow, my point is that uh, I think the um, collective body of work that uh, Iran has produced represents a school of thought in Iranian um, uh, historical studies that surely cannot be missed. In other words, anybody who is going to be working on uh, uh, Iranian uh, history needs to intellectually wrestle uh, with the approach that Abrahamian has uh, so nicely uh, 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 championed. Um, and um, again, just like the rest of my colleagues, I want to thank everyone for a lifetime of breakthrough work. Thanks. Thank you. Um, uh, I share a lot of things that have been already said by my colleagues and friends. Um, uh, communism and communalism in Iran was the first, which was published in 1970, uh, was one of the first uh, works, Professor Abrahamia, that I read. Um, I was about 20 and um, uh, 20 years old, and that was in Paris, and uh, I won't tell you when was that. Uh, less, than a couple, uh, less than a year later, actually, Iran between two revolutions uh, came out. I was deeply influenced by Professor Abrahamian's approach, uh, both uh, theoretically and methodologically. Uh, first, his anti-orientalist, anti-culturalist approach, um, his analysis of Iran's history and politics as a class-based society, and his emphasis on class conflict, class consciousness, ethnic or religious social relations. He stressed the crucial importance of class ties and argued that they tended to supplant the vertical sentiments of clan, tribe, uh, locality, sect. And from amongst uh, social classes, his emphasis on the role of new or modern uh, middle classes in Iran's politics sounded so crucial, so important, so innovating, uh, and so pertinent uh, to me who had experienced the Iranian revolution, and as you know, the role of uh, middle classes was very important in this revolution. So I've continued reading him as a major source to understand modern Iran. And uh, I reread several of his works uh, recently, just uh, for today. Uh, Professor Abrahamian writes history from below, presents and analyzes social movements, uh, social classes, or ethnic struggles. Another characteristic of his work is uh, his multidisciplinarity. Uh, Abrahamian's work, however, have not paid much attention to gender hierarchy, women's agency and struggles, and here I'm getting critical, uh, and the role that they have played in the making of modern Iran and in state building. Likewise, 
his articulation, the articulation between gender inequalities and other class, ethnic, or religious inequalities have not been analyzed. Women, however, are not totally absent from Professor Mohammed's works. For example, in A History of Modern Iran, published in 2008, there is a political who's who at the beginning of the book, and we can find the name of two women out of 42 people listed. <laughs> That's uh, the ratio is 5%. Mm -hmm. Princess Ashraf, the Shah's twin sister, and Shirine Ebadi, the Nobel Prize winner. But women kind of disappear in the core of the book. Uh, one wonders why uh, there is no mention of Bolat al when he discusses the Babi movement, or even Mahdi Olya, Nasser bin Shah's mother, when he discusses the Bajar dynasty, or especially women's participation as revolution makers in the constitutional revolution, or their efforts to found associations, journals, schools, both before and after the revolution, or their demand for voting rights in 1909, not to mention their active participation in the movement for the nationalization of oil under Mossad and especially the 1979 revolution. Furthermore, modern Iran has also been constructed through modern literature, poetry, painting, movies, to which women have tremendously contributed. In his discussion of Reza Shah and Shah's reforms, women are often portrayed either as passive victims or passive beneficiaries of social transformations, but they are not recognized as agents of social transformation. Gender dimension is um, reading, uh, I'm giving you the list of the books I've uh, reread recently. Gen uh, gender dimension is also absent from his analysis of populist ideology in Khomeinism, published in 1993. My friends just talk about it. In his pioneering uh, work entitled Tortured Confessions, Prisons and Public Recantations in Modern Iran, which was published in 1999, Professor Abrahamian uses extensively women prisoners' memoirs. Shahnushi Parsipur and Raho are often quoted throughout the book. Yet, instead of attributing agency to women, and analyzing women's writings as crucial moments in the process of their subjectivation, uh, women's right, uh, sorry, identity construction, active construction of the self, resistance against autocracy, oppression and repression, <coughs> their intellectual autonomy from their comrades or brothers, and as a consequence of their interaction with unequal social relations and their willingness to overcome sub-authority, Professor Abrahamian argues that women wrote their memoirs more than men because they were often only sympathizers of political organizations and thus were free to record their personal experience. In his account of modern Iranian history and politics, Professor Abrahamian has always given much weight to subalterns, the oppressed, and to their struggles and movements. The problem is that he has considered the oppressed as gender neutral. Gender social relations, however, are at the heart of social relations of power. Critical examination of various domains of knowledge is necessary to the understanding of obstacles to our gender, class, race, religious, or ethnic equality and social justice. So let me end um, my talk by asking a question to Professor Abrahamian. I want to know whether he agrees with me or not. Uh, agrees with my contention <laughs> that historians, even those who stress class, race, religion, or ethnic dimensions of social relations of power, but neglect gender dimensions, end up writing his story instead of history. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I was first introduced to Erman's work in 1978-79. That was the first year of college. I was looking up, like Mirza, what's going on with the left, and I read articles by him in medical books, and it was, they were very useful. And after that, I followed kind of follow. I would like to talk about two aspects of his work, and I would like to remind to Raj Atalaki that I was uh, promised a little bit more. A little bit, not very much. <laughs> so, uh, I, I, will, I, will, uh, I will talk about the coup d'etat and the coup d'etat, the Basta Shirin coup d'etat uh, in, in a moment. Uh, but I would, uh, first, I would like to talk about two of his articles, which were published in 1974 and 1975, about um, 
the differences between European feudalism and uh, uh, Middle Eastern despotism, or the Asiatic mode of production. Uh, the reason I would like to talk about these two articles is because uh, uh, either of them or the, the, the two together uh, are very useful in classroom environments if you want to uh, basically promote some sort of discussion among students regarding uh, whether cultural issues determine uh, political systems or socio-economic issues. Uh, and what Marx, you know, this is a good way of introducing Marx and Engels into the discussion. And I think Marxian view has still a lot of bearing on understanding social history. So uh, it's a very good way of bringing those in. And then, uh, of course, comparing uh, Engels and Marx's approach, which are different, uh, uh, with Ottoman Empire and Rajar Iran. Uh, which, uh, if, if, if though for those of you who teach Middle East history like I do, uh, we cover both the Ottoman Empire and Qajar Iran in modern times, and the difference between the two, the type of government that they had, the type of control that they had from the center to the periphery, uh, is very much uh, uh, open with this for discussion. With, it, but with, with, with this article being put for uh, for kind of uh, classroom discussion, so I'll, that's what I, that's the first thing I, want, I wanted to say. The second issue is, of course, uh, the coup d'etat. Uh, now, uh, Ervan uh, has uh, made major contributions to that. There is a, uh, there is a shallow movement uh, to reread the 1953 coup d'etat uh, and to reinterpret it as it never happened, or if it happened, it happened uh, in three different days, in, you know, in two different days. And uh, we were all both in a conference in, um, uh, in Manchester last year, and uh, he, uh, he made a keynote uh, speech. He has published a book on that issue and an article before that, and of course he attends to that on issue uh, thoroughly in uh, Iran between two revolutions. So um, uh, the, the 1953 coup d'etat is a subject that uh, he has uh, uh, opened the way for others to follow, myself included. Uh, and then, of course, the study of Tudor Party, you know, uh, not only uh, the social base of Tudor Party, which you mentioned, and the way he, he approached uh, in trying to s uh, determine where, where the social base is, but also uh, uh, opening the way for understanding different political tendencies within the Tudor Party, uh, and even bringing out some people that we may not have uh, uh, encountered, like Asari and Fred, uh, which uh, I think is, uh, has disappeared, and you kind of resurrected him. Right? And this, this type of resurrections are, uh, are, are pretty uh, useful to understanding uh, one's uh, history. Uh, but there are still, uh, of course, controversial issues uh, remain in the study of uh, coup d'etat. Uh, that's why I call it Basa Shilin coup d'etat. Uh, uh, one issue uh, Van Magadam mentioned is, 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 is uh, where what was the primary cause behind the decision to stage a coup d'etat? Was it really oil, and or was it a really ideological Cold War concepts? You know, uh, and uh, the uh, 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 you know prominent heavyweights are behind each argument. So, you, uh, and you know, Gazirovsky, Mark Gazirovsky has done a lot of work uh, based on American uh, research on American intelligence and uh, archives, and uh, Ervan uh, and Mark have it different view on this, uh, of course. And this is open for discussion, and maybe if he has time, he can go back to it, but he has written on it, but I would like to bring it up. Uh, so, uh, um, uh, was it uh, uh, the uh, American concern for Cold War issues, so primarily uh, the uh, falling of Iran into the hands of the USSR, uh, that, uh, that caused uh, the toppling of uh, Dr. Mossadegh's government, uh, or was it really oil? Uh, well known there was an excess of oil in the market uh, and there was no immediate no, uh, need for the lack of Iranian oil, for the absence of Iranian oil in the market and the lack of the absence of Iranian oil for the past two years since nationalization didn't really uh, 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 fluctuate the market. So which one is it? Uh, my question to Iran is, uh, is, is, is it possible that the, the coup d'etat happened for two uh, different angles? I mean, for the Americans it was Cold War ideological. For the British, it was oil, uh, and that the British could bring the new American administration to back their plan because they they, even, they contacted Eisenhower people even before they came to power after the election. Uh, is it possible that they could come to the same conclusion or the same point of let's, let's say let's topple this guy, the old man, uh, but they come from different angles? So that's one question. The second one is the, the second issue is about the Tudor Party itself, of course. Um, and the role of the Tudor Party has been controversial. I think 
uh, when you read uh, uh, Ervan's work, uh, you realize that the traditional Iranian, especially leftist view, but also is a Muslim uh, activist, that the Trudeau party betrayed Khianat, uh, the, the notion of betrayal, Khianat, uh, is put behind us. I mean, uh, there was no betrayal. The Trudeau party was trying to respond uh, to a very, very uh, nerve-breaking and rapidly changing uh, situation. But the, the, the fact that the question still remains, uh, the Trudeau party, uh, despite its rhetoric, despite its claims, despite its uh, huffing and puffing, really didn't do anything. And he just wait for them to come and uh, chop his head off. So uh, what, what happened here? And uh, uh, um, Ervan has argued, and I think uh, some of his arguments, some of his, his arguments are very convincing, that you know, if you wanted to use the military network, the Trudeau's military network, you needed to have uh, access to uh, tank divisions uh, in order to counter the, 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 the co-perpetrators. And that the Trudeau network was really among uh, 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 officers which were not, uh, with no access to tank divisions. And modern coup d'etats are done when tanks are broken into streets and smashed into buildings. Uh, <clears throat> that's, uh, that, is a, that is a very interesting and important point. But my point, uh, and I would like to now pose the question from this angle, was that the Trudeau had access to weapons and could, uh, uh, to their own admission, distribute. Uh, a number of weapons to his cadres, and uh, in, in it, they had told the cadres after the first attempt failed on the, on the 16th that they, they that get ready to receive weapons. Um, uh, bottom line, the Trudeau party remained completely inactive. My, my answer was it was paralyzed and it, because of factional divisions, he could not make a decision. Um, uh, are you, uh, after uh, you know all these years, I mean, what do you think? Let's go back to this subject and talk. Why did the Trudeau Party uh, not move at all? Why did it remain inactive? Why did the Trudeau Party uh, not use whatever facilities it had? You know, I mean, it, it could have used them and lost. It still lost, but it would. It could have taken a step, but it just decided to wait for the uh, uh, for the security forces to come after it, and to the date of the 19th. Uh, uh, I'm the last one, but it's an honor for me to stand here in front of my supervisor, PhD supervisor, Irvine. Uh, we all owe uh, very much to Irvine for bringing uh, labor and subaltern agency uh, to the Iranian historiography. Numerous books published in modern Iran, but no reference to labor. Uh, the first work I read uh, by Erwan was an article published some 35 years ago, uh, Formation of the Proletariat in Modern Iran, 1941-53, presented in 78 at the Fernand Brudel Center for Study of Economics, Historical System and Civilization. He argued that in this article, class is not a statistic things that can be understood with a lot of conceptual huffing and puffing, but a dynamic happening that can be appreciated only which the observer can study the movement, the heat and thundering noise. He continues, in the 20th century, there are two main periods when the political surface was broken, exposing social structure needs between the Constitutional Revolution in 1905 and the establishment of Reza Shah military autocracy in 1925. And from the destruction of the Reza Shah's autocracy in 1941 to the establishment of Mohammad Reza Shah's autocracy in 1953. Uh, for the social <coughs> scientists, he continues, these are two valuable periods in which one can examine the social base of politics, the social deep support, for the competing parties, the relation between social forces, and thus determines whether these were, these were such a thing as class politics, and class, were, were, class which was things in themselves, or whether they were also things for themselves. Things for in, in class in itself, class for themselves. The interpretation that was uh, Ervan saying in his article, and then I should say that the interpretation of working class formation and representation as a direct outcome 
of structural economic change and capitalist development is a common to the labor historiography of many societies, North and South. Iran is not exception in this regard. In Iranian labor historiography, if exists, the standard interpretation of working class formation and representation of, can often be found in the narrative uh, mooted by the theological Marxism. Around with his neo-Marxist Thompsonian approach does different. Yet, the conventional structuralist objectivist definition of the workers and working class, along with a sense of what should be classified as authentic activism, can be challenged. Working class formation, in fact,